Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new episode of Chat. My name is Brian Kearney. Absolutely delighted today to be joined by TV personality Kyle Christie. Kyle, how are you doing? I'm very good, mate. Yourself? Not too bad, not too bad. Just want to start good, saying, good. I want to say a big thank you to you for coming onto the podcast. I'm sure you get inundated with requests for various ones, so I appreciate you coming on, coming on to my one today. Really appreciate it, man. No, I've got to do it for an old friend, haven't uh, I? Yeah, good. <laughs> we'll go back to 2008, me and you. That's when I first met you. Yeah, I think it, it might have been around 2000 and te- I think it was 2010, was it? No, Was it? I, I, thought, it was so. two, I thought it was 2008. I remember you playing in Troppies. That's when yeah. I first met you, yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, end. just to, just to give anyone um, listening in or watching, I've uh, I met Kyle when he was very young, when he was sleeping on the on the floor of my friend's <laughs> apartment in Ibiza. <laughs> I was. What what age were you? Sixteen or seventeen? Maybe was it? I was I was sixteen then. Sixteen. I was sixteen, yeah. seventeen, and I, uh, my brother Adam, he was living with them, and I got evicted out of uh, my uh, accommodation, my apartment, and I had to. Uh, go down and live on a lilo on the floor. I remember you, man. I remember you. <laughs> I, had, I had to get up and party every time everyone else wanted to. I, I had to be the last person yeah. in bed because I was in the front room. I remember your little uh, lilo on the ground and yep. you, you, were, you, were that t- you were that teen. Yeah, you were yep, I was like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the, the, to, for, for people, there's a, there's a backstory to why, why I have you on the podcast today. Obviously, um, my podcast has mainly focused on people within the dance scene, but I, I don't want to pigeonhole into just just the one thing. I, I I like to speak to different people about their experiences in life, and uh, you're you're probably one of the most well known people that I would know outside of the dance scene. So it's it, it's great to speak to you today. And uh, the first thing I, I usually start out: How have you found the last twelve months with, with everything that has been going on? Um, to work wise, it's hasn't been that bad for me because uh, I mean. MTV with the protocols and stuff like that, it's absolutely crazy. Like they just test us like five or six times a week. So with going away and doing the shows, it's it's been all right work wise, but uh, mental wise, you don't realize how much it affects someone like like me or yourself who like go out all the time because it's um it's socialization. It's yeah. being social with other people. I, I get a, a big a big boost off that, and because I go out um, once a week. Um, on a Saturday, maybe a Friday. Um, but normally I get that big boost of the social embrace and then it carries me on through the week. But being stuck in the house, and anyone can say it, you can you can party in the house, you can do this, you can do that. Well, you can't. It's just not the same of being face to face with someone. Yeah. That's 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 been the same for me. Like just just being stuck inside and just the same thing for a year, man. I've just been recording sets in my kitchen, and I, I just can't do it anymore. It's just like oh, yeah. it's a killer. It's killer. Oh, for, yeah, it's, it's it's horrible. But um, this at the moment there there seems to be a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, and things, especially for you in the UK, it's a little bit different here. We're we're a little bit behind, but I I, I don't really want to talk anymore about COVID because I'm I'm all I'm at Novid at this stage, not COVID, man. It's just too much. You're all COVID out. Yeah, I've just been I've just talked about it too much, and we I did a big podcast on all uh, to do with it the last time, so I'm, I don't really want to talk about. It. I want to talk about other stuff. So um, yeah, like obviously I know I've known you since then. I I knew your brother really well. I know Adam. Uh, 10, 11 years we used to do uh, very messy back-to-back sets and troppy back then. <laughs> yes. uh, really good times and um, obviously the first time that I met you was in beat at that time but then myself and Edel came over to uh, Newcastle for a weekend a couple of years later and you'd grown about four foot <laughs> it, 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 wide it, in height and wide uh, you'd aged I don't know you looked about you looked older than me at this stage <laughs> yeah. but you you, you you you'd gone from being that like uh, sort of really thin kid to being a, a, a doorman working on a door and yeah like, yep. what the fuck yep. is this fella eating like it was yeah. it was unreal but uh Everything. Like was, yeah, that so was... you, you, you matured really yeah, quickly and I just couldn't believe how, how old you look and then um Obviously, then I think uh, I was thinking back to the last time I saw you. I think it was at uh, Creamfields a couple of years ago. Was the last time I saw you, and um, obviously you're you're someone who is into the music. Uh, you've gotten to Creamfields. I think you've been to a state of trance the last couple of years as well. Yep. And you're you're really good friends with uh, Christoph, the amazing mm-hmm. producer. So uh, could you could you tell the people listening or watching about uh, 
about your feelings towards dance music, etc. Oh, I absolutely love it. I've, I grew up around it. So do you know when I met you in Tropies for the first time, that was the first year I came over to Ibiza. I was 16 and I was getting paid to carry my brother's DJ bag down the <laughs> West End. I was getting paid 15 euros a day to do that. And I made it last. <laughs> I'm sure you did, yeah. <laughs> and uh, when I went into Tropies for the first time, that's actually not only the first ever trance bar I went into, but it was the first club I ever went into. So I fell in love with that scene straight away. Like, I mean, you've been in Tropies countless amounts of times. Obviously, it's not there anymore and stuff. But as soon as you walk through, your ears are just deafened by it. And it's just, it, it's so loud and so beautiful that everything in the room shaking. And yeah. I fell in love with the music from then. Yeah, Oscar behind the bar getting us nicely uh, oiled up every time. Yeah. Every time. And I don't think I ever spent a penny in there. I didn't spend a penny in there for years. I was just, uh, my way of paying them back was to do random sets here and there. But yeah, f- f- fantastic memories. But then the last time I saw you would have been at Creamfield. And uh, I was thinking back to that show. I, I have a story from the day before that. So... I was I was the Sunday where I saw you and Adam and everyone else at the at the gig because you came down with Christoph for for yeah. the gig. Yeah. But the on the Friday night before that, I was in Russia playing in Russia, and I was flying back from Russia through Finland on the Saturday, and I had like a three hour connection uh, in Finland for my flight back to Dublin. So I was just sitting in the lounge chilling out, waiting around, and I was keeping an eye on the, my flight time and that and. It was on my thing. It had the, the flight time on my, on my boarding pass ready to go. And uh, I was sort of just, I saw it was time. I didn't want to go down to the gate too early. So I was walking down and uh, I saw John Double O Fleming, the DJ, just randomly. And I started chatting to him and he asked me what time my flight was. And I said it's in a few minutes. So I just went over to see uh, what gate the flight was at. And I went over and checked that and I said, uh, flight closed. And I was there, what? How is this possible? And then I, I, I ran down to the, the gate and he told me that the flight was closed. I I was so used to the boarding pass telling me my boarding time, not the flight time. Yeah, so this is the yeah. first time this has happened. And they wouldn't let me on the flight, even though the plane hadn't taken off. And I was begging them, begging them, begging them to let me on the flight, but they wouldn't. So I was there, what will I do? And she 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 called someone for me. And she says, look, there's a flight to London. Uh, you can get that. It's in like a half an hour. You'll have to run up and book another ticket. So I had to run up to the, the British Airways counter and or it was either Finn Air or British Airways and booked a flight but the last seat on the flight to London cost me 500 euro to get on the Ooh. flight so then I got onto that flight while I was getting onto the flight I had to ring British Airways to book me a seat to get me from London to Dublin on the last flight out that night another 300 euros <laughs> So I, I somehow, I, I had to get home, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to make it to Creamfield. So I got home and Edel was coming with me because we want, Eric Prids was playing the Sunday night and it was, we, we both of us had been looking forward to seeing him for so long. And I go, have you checked in for your flight? And I go, y- you, you never sent me my flights. I forgot to book her flights as well. So I had to book her flight and my flights <laughs> then again. Another 500 euro. <laughs> so that, that was one of my... Uh, what could I say? One of the most stupid days of my uh, DJing career to, to 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 get to the gig where I saw you that day. It was just anything that could have gone wrong that day did go wrong. But eventually, you still had a good time when yeah, you got there, though. Yes, it did. Yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was a great day, and um, I remember uh, see, that was the first time I'd seen in a few years. And and the thing that I noticed was you 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 hadn't changed at all. You were real, still really down to earth. You're really approachable. And we were out walking around in the crowd and I remember that we were sort of standing in the middle of a mucky field and you were standing there, but every single person that was walking past was like, there's there's Kyle, there's Kyle, there's Kyle. Yeah. Everyone noticed you and like you were so polite and you would no attitude or ego towards everyone. And it was it was really good to see that you hadn't changed. Obviously, you've, you've become more um, popular and you've done really well in your career, but you still were the same nice kid that you've you've always been so um like when it was around 2013 2014 that you went into the the Geordie Shore the first time yep. how, how did, did you find it really difficult going from being someone who's relatively unknown to being so widely known in such a short space of time um yeah i did I, it was difficult at first but 
I mean, back in 2013, 14, 15, there was no reality people apart from like Only Ways, Essex and Geordie Shaw and that. So it was actually much worse back then. Now it's been diluted with like Love Island and all these different TV shows. So it's not as bad. It's more of like a, it's more of a career now uh, rather than being like a reality star because I feel like you could probably go and study it at uni now. You yeah. could probably just study being in reality TV. But um, it was very hard at first to adapt to. But you got to think I was in 2013 when I got on, I was 20 years old. No, 20, 21, just turned 21. And now I'm 28. I don't know any different. I've never known my 20s not having that around me. Um, so I just don't acknowledge it. And I think it's a lot to do with the upbringing. So my upbringing was really good. My, my mom and dad, very social people, always in pubs, always in clubs, absolutely loving life. And they were always talkative people. Yeah. Um, and I learned that from them. And I'm a very talkative person. I'm interested in other people rather than just being caught up in my own egotist egotistical plan. Yeah. Yeah, yep. so like um, when when you went in there first, it did... It, was it like a massive change the amount of attention you you, you got because like especially when, when you're that age uh, Kyle when you're 20 years of age your brain hasn't still fully developed so like there's a the, the parts about your maturity and your self image and your judgement that, that, that part of your brain doesn't really form until you're around 25 and to be honest I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little bit older now with, with everything that's going on in the world and um, like I, I'm 38 I'm 38 now man I still feel at times where I'm still a kid, you know, like it, it must have been very difficult for you um, to go from just being a normal kid because at that age, you are a kid. I, I still, yeah, yeah, yeah. At 28, I honestly, you're still a kid, man. You, yeah. You get older, but you don't grow up. That's that's what I'm learning with my life anyway. But did you find it difficult to, to that initial stage of going into the public eye after not being in it at all? It was, the weird thing was about it is when people were asking and like stopping us and asking for photos of us. And that was yeah. from the get go. That was from the jump. Like that was, I wasn't even on TV yet. All I'd done is film the, the show. I'd filmed the first Geordie show. So it was, it was very weird to get used to. And um, there's certain things that happens. Like it's quite stressful when everyone's screaming your name and you're walking through a busy crowd. Um, I'm much better at dealing with it now, but I wasn't good at dealing with it back then. I just put my hood up, zip up just try and stay away from it um but yeah ap apart from that it's just it was very stressful at first um and it was hard to adapt to it was hard to overcome but there was also like certain moments it was normally when i had one too many drinks um and a lad would say something to impress a girl or something like that and they would all nip at us but i'm from a i'm from a i've grew up in a quite a rough area where someone says something to you, you're getting knocked the fuck out. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that... I, f I was fighting every few weeks well, when yeah. I first got in Geordie Shaw. Yeah, every few weeks. It was normally... It was the same time every week. It was half... About two, half two in the morning. And there was just a little snip comment of someone saying something to us. And plus, I was Mr. Macho Man. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was... Uh, I was. It was a very violent time for me. Very d depressing time as well. It was uh, got us into a dark place. Yeah, uh, and w w when when you were working in, a, w w was sort of a, a psychological and um, w were you given the supports by MTV to sort of speak to people to to deal with having trying to process all of that and such a change in your life? Were you offered support about how to sort of uh, deal with all that? Um, at first, we were. It was like this person came in and they taught you how to act uh, through the press. It, it, honestly, mate, it's so weird. You like go down and you're like back at school. So you get like a tutor um, in the MTV office thing and she teaches you how to act on TV and how to, if someone comes to you or something, you have to like process it and like, it, it's like a mindset training yeah. that's what it was like it was like changing your mindset from because you got to think mtv were casting people who would argue people that would uh shag birds people that would do all this stuff that's quite volatile people um so they needed to do that training with us um i do think there could be a little bit more aftercare um for me i've never had to go through aftercare because there might be some now i'm not sure since everything that's happened but I went from one TV show to another, so I never had to do the aftercare part. But 
Yeah, um, I feel like there could be more of that, I would say. Might be that now, though, I'm not sure. Yeah, and then, like, obviously, as you were getting more... Like, did, did you ever feel like the the character... Like, it's a reality show. Did, did you ever feel like the two of them overlapped? Because, obviously, I think, I've think i always known you as such a nice, qu- ploy gent, you know what I mean? And then the, the Geordie Shore image is the sort of going out or doing whatever you're doing. Did you feel like there was an overlap betwi- Geordie, between the Geordie, two? Geordie Shaw will fit you into their narrative of what they want from you. Um, and that was what they did with me. I mean, I mean, you like, I'm nothing like my character on Geordie Shaw. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. But the, the edit's a beautiful thing. It can make <laughs> you look like whatever the yeah, one thing you look the, like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. These yeah. people are talented, man. These people yeah. are fucking talented. Um, and they made me look a certain way. And that's not me. If, the, the TV show I'm in at the minute, the challenge, that is the real me. Yeah. Because um, I went into the challenge, I thought, I'm not going to be what the directors want me to be. I'm going to be Kyle. And I just stayed with being me. And that's what they got. And uh, I've been much more successful doing the challenge than I was Geordie Shaw. Geordie Shaw put me in a very dark place. It was um, it was a depressing time. It was like, because when it came to the end, um, I was hated. so Because I was the villain. And I get it. I was the villain. I have to have a villain. But I was hated so much that I was getting people shouting at us in the streets, stuff I'd done on a TV show. I was like, yeah, man, it's a TV show. Mm. Calm down. Who cares? Yeah, it's yeah. That, that, that type of shit. Like, the the online abuse or, or stuff like that, that's that's virtual. So like, that's, it, like, that's, but when you're getting that type of abuse and that sort of thing in real life, that must have been very difficult to take. Yeah, yeah. Well, um. With Geordie Shaw, like I said, I was getting it all the time. It was to the point where I couldn't even post. Uh, it was Memorial Day. It was Veterans Day or something like that. And uh, I posted a photo of my granddad's World War II medals. And people were commenting on it saying, I can't believe you did this to this person on the show. I'm like, who gives a fucking shit? I'm like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, It was uh, crazy. But I do get a lot of comments when I'm out and I'm walking about. Uh, well, I used to. Now it's, it's all good now. And... I think the first two years of being in reality TV or even the first year to two years, everything affects you a lot more. But when you grow up and you realise that it doesn't even matter what these random people think. I, I mean, I, I'm not slagging them off. They the pay, the pay my bills, the, course, the my bread, yeah. like the get my bread. Um, but it doesn't matter what they think. Um, because I don't know them. If I know you and I'm friends with you, it matters to me what you think. Like it matters to me what you think of us and what my brother thinks of us and uh, all my friends that I've met. If I've met you face to face and you hate us, then I'll be like, oh damn it, mm. <laughs> I must be a prick. But I, I'm not going to be affected by people I don't know. Exactly, man. And what other I people? I refuse to. What other people think of it is none of your business, really. It should be just the people who are the closest to you in your exactly, life, and the people mate. you respect. No, nothing else matters. Is it? The rest is bullshit, man. Yeah, exactly, exactly true, mate. So the the challenge, you'll have to forgive me. I haven't uh, I haven't seen it. Can you can you explain what the the show is about? So the challenge is about um, it's a TV show, and it's all about you. Like twenty eight people go into a house. You all compete against each other, but it's like a, it's like a, a the like New York calls it America's fifth sport, New York Weekly. And you go into a house and you all compete against each other. So you have to eliminate each other. You have to run up mountains. You have to jump out of planes. It's like James Bond shit. And then at the end, you get to the final, which there's only like four people left. And if you win the final, you win a million dollars, um, which would be just pretty fucking awesome, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, Jesus. Especially, that's, that sounds like a good thing to me, since seeing as though I've been on the doll for the last year. <laughs> Is, can I enter? Yeah, of course. <laughs> you don't have to worry about anything, mate. You can get by on your talent. People yeah. know you for your talent. I've got to get by on fucking sh- stupid personality. Ah, uh, fuck off, man. <laughs> You'll you, always be safe. You have loads of things going for you there. Just even by looking at you, we just stop. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but like, obviously, going back to that... Um, you're saying that you're in sort of a dark place you're in Jordy Shore obviously you're probably reading stuff about yourself in the papers and all that shit that must have been very difficult as well oh yeah the papers were one side the papers will always be sided towards um, towards making you a bad it, it's it's not it's it's better for them to read about baddies than goodies so they will make you look as bad as possible it was more the online papers that were a nightmare and they just just lied about different stuff and I just couldn't believe what they were saying, the shit and that. It was just like, where have you got that from? 
it's absolute bullshit. Yeah, it's just all clickbait. They just want your attention. That's that's what it's all about. It doesn't exactly. matter. Exactly. It doesn't matter if the story's true or not. They just want you to click in, and that's how they make their money from the revenue from the ads and that. But uh, it, it must have been it must have been very difficult, and and you, you can see from the past few few years, like the the kids that are going into Love Oil and then that, and the the, 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 the negative feedback, like t- social media and special especially Twitter. Twitter is a it's a sewer. It's a, I don't use I don't use it I don't at do, all. Neither do I, man. I haven't. It's horrible. I still post stuff on Twitter, but I haven't read any mentions or anything like Same. that. I think it was. I think it was the uh, New Year's Eve twenty seventeen was the last time I read it, and I just won't go on it. It's it's completely toxic. And when I stopped reading it, it did a lot for my own mental health because obviously you, you're you're reading stuff that's not true about you. But what was happening with me was I I would be reading uh, feedback about myself, say about a set or uh, a song I made or something, and I could be reading a lot of stuff that's good, but there'd be one or two that wouldn't be good, and that would be the ones that I'd remember. And it would have a negative effect on how I I viewed myself. So I had to take the decision um, for my own mental health and and that just to stop reading it because it's all bullshit, man. It, it none of that stuff matters. If once I feel like I'm doing my best and doing what I'm doing, that's all I can do. If people like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. So that's that's all I can really do. And just one th- one mean comment is worth like 2000 you know that's the way your mind works you yeah. think that one mean comment will stick out more than 2000 good comments and it's just the way we're wired and it's you need to change that thought process that's what uh that's what i try to do but twitter i stay completely away from that everyone's just fucking mean to each other <laughs> just like so mean it's so weird man because like it, it people act differently on facebook there's arguments but it but it's sort of civilized arguments then on instagram people are sort of okay to each other and then on twitter they just hate each other sorry my dog is after walking into this studio here <laughs> <laughs> we'll get out wherever you go on <laughs> good boy go on sorry yeah but there's just there's different um just people act differently on social media but it's, it's so weird because none of them actually exist they're, they're just things on your phone that you're looking at but it, what you're saying there is right our brains are wired for negativity it's called the negativity bias and um, negative negative events are far stronger than positive events you have to have five positive events to counteract one negative event yep. and especially the you're talking about there what's in the media that's that's why they, they do that because your your brains are drawn to negative and it, it, to, to the bad things. That's what our brains are to. So when they're writing, they'd rather write something terrible about you in the paper to get people to click into it to get their revenue for their money rather rather than writing something good. Um, so like trolls, negative comments, that must be stuff that you've had to to deal with a lot as well. It is what I do with the papers. If I'm ever in the papers now, I do this thing called the mom effect where I get my mom to read the article and then she tells me what it said. But if I give it to my mom and she reads it, she only brings out the good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it yeah. makes me feel so much better. Yeah. Um, going back to the Love Island thing, you know what you said with the these people going in Love Island and the, the, the not protected. I, I don't feel like they are because they, the, the, you've got to think these kids are really good looking, stripped down, like have been told they're amazing the whole of their lives. And then they're going onto this platform where they just get attacked constantly. And I think they haven't, they haven't built, like I've built up a shield over time to protect myself of from negativity, but they haven't built that yet. And Love Island's a different story. Like that, that show is just fucking mental. Like you just get, you go from like a normal person all the way up here straight away. It's uh, it's insane. The, the back and you get off it. I mean, people get like a million followers off like two weeks of TV. I don't think that's the same anywhere else in the world. Because mm-hmm. um, I work with a lot of Americans and they even said it. They said that they've never heard of someone getting a million followers off two weeks of work. Yeah, it's it's, um, cra- it's, it's crazy. Yeah, crazy. And it's, yeah. it's very difficult for them to deal with that sort of going from from being being an unknown to, to, to that sort of sp- in the spotlight that much. And... The thing is, like you're talking about, they're they're all really good looking and amazing bodies and all that. But the thing is, people like that that look like that are usually very very insecure about their about their looks as well. 100%. Like you, you, you wouldn't think it, but but they are. They're they're very uh, self conscious and stuff. So you can imagine when they come out of being in the the Love Island villa and that 
and then to be reading the shit that they get sent on Instagram and all that, it must be very, very difficult for them to deal with that, yeah. Yeah, 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 Ex exactly, mate. I mean, I was one of them, like, when I was, because uh, you said that you met me at, si like, 16, 17, and then you didn't, we didn't see each other for two or three years. I turned into that. I was, like, part of that uh, generation where I just went to the gym every day, looked after myself, all I cared about was what girls thought of us and all that shit, and... It's a very insecure time. I mean, I can vouch for them that that is like that. Yeah, it. I was the same. I, I'm. I, the, the reason why I probably stopped reading the comments about them. I, I, I am a bit insecure and I'm very self conscious and I, I'm sensitive to all that stuff. So I'd rather just not read them and I'd rather just get on with my day and focus on what I'm doing rather than what some person who will never me. Um what they think of me because I can't control that. I can only control what I do and, and what I do with my day rather than what someone's writing on the internet about me. But the, the best thing that I've probably read about myself was that someone said I was addicted to crystal meth. That was the best one. <laughs> the they said, I, they said, I was, they said I, I was looking really good after being addicted to crystal meth. So that, that was one of the best things that I read about myself, man. Yeah. Where did that come from? I don't know. Like, <laughs> some, some American mad bastard just wrote that about me. I was just like, what? Oh, Americans are nuts. Americans are crazy. I had a, a argument the other day with an American about, because uh, I got the vaccine because I'm diabetic. Yeah. So I got the vaccine and me and this woman, I don't know why I did it because uh, I've, I'm, I've got a baby on the way. And the woman started mentioning my baby saying, I feel sorry for his uh, child. I feel sorry for his kid. It's going to grow up horrible. The baby's probably going to die because of you've had the vaccine. I was like, do you not realize that? Like, this is why I, I bit because I'd never bite, never, ever bite. But I bit because they were mentioning something that I love that isn't myself. So I can't, I can protect myself, but I can't protect the baby. But uh, I was like, do you not realize that my bit of the baby's over? Like biologically, my bit's over. Like she's having a kid. I'm here. Your like job is my, done. My, yeah, my job's done. So I've had the vaccine after that. So even if there was some crazy mutation or something, it couldn't be anything to do with me. So I started biting and arguing. I shouldn't have done it really, but I just went absolutely nuts of her. And I was arguing with her for about four and a half hours. And then what sort of a <laughs> mood were you in then? Horrible. Mm. Horrible mood. Horrible mood. Just don't. There's no point to, to even. Uh, and I, obviously, she said something so personal to you that, that triggered that reaction where you wanted to um get involved in that conflict with her but there's just no point man you're you're dealing with people who are nuts it's yeah. as simple as that like oh know. yeah yeah yeah. there's no point biting i mean you're never gonna win unless and what, you stand unless you stand in front of them and you can fill them in that's the only way you're gonna win <laughs> <laughs> that's what you would have done about eight years ago probably yeah basically. exactly yeah. exactly yeah but uh yeah you're, you mentioned about diabetes there is it which is a type a that you have or, <laughs> yeah 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 and what yeah. sort of effect does, does that have on your on your overall life well when i first went into geordie's show i didn't tell them about the diabetes okay. i kept it all a secret which was very dangerous on my part this is nothing to do with them they 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 had no like it wasn't their fault at all um, it was all mine. I lied because I thought I would protect myself against uh, them saying no because it's it could be liable on them that they say no because they don't want a diabetic guy like myself drinking every night. So I lied about it, which was very fucking stressful because I had to hide the injections. I had to pick when to inject myself. Obviously, there's cameras all around the room, so I had to just hide the lot. How did you manage um, to do that? Crazy, mate. Absolutely crazy. Um... I mean, I hid them in cases, I hid them in uh, uh, brushes, strapped them to my skin, um, everything, mate, everything. Uh, it was it was a mental time for us, but with the challenge, when I, when I came out of that, I thought to myself, I'm not lying about this anymore. And I came out of the challenge and said, listen, I'm diabetic, uh, do what you want with it. And the challenge was like, oh, okay, no problem. Yeah. I was like... Are you fucking kidding me? I've been hiding this for five years. I was expecting a big coming out party. I was expecting mm. everyone to be like, oh my God, I can't believe you've admitted it. And then they, they just were all okay with it. But I think Jordy Shaw probably would have been okay with it. I was just very insecure in myself at that time that I thought that it would be a no. And being on Jordy Shaw was more important than me, than my health. So. And what sort of effect was that constant drinking having on your effect when you were in there? Oh, um, with my diabetes, I'm like a, I'm a weirdo when it comes to diabetes. Nothing ever affects me. Um, and nothing ever affects us when it comes to diabetes. It just doesn't. Whereas 
on on the challenge, I'm running all the time. I'm running up mountains. I'm jumping out of planes and that. So if anything, it's it's healthier for me to be doing stuff like that rather than drinking all the time. But yeah. And obviously, um, one of them, I, never, I, saw, I know I wasn't going to talk about COVID, but it, just in relation to having diabetes, that must have been quite worrying for you over the past year because isn't, isn't that one of the biggest sort of um, the worst underlying conditions that you can have? Yeah, yeah, it was, mate. That's why I got the vaccine. And um, I'm I'm very, I, I, I thought to myself, I'll be fine no matter what. If I get it, I'm fine. I've never had it, um, by the way, but all my family have had it. I actually got this into my head that I was immune to it because, because all my family had it. My Adam had it. Uh, his girlfriend had it. Uh, my mum and dad did. My girlfriend did. And I was just next to all of them and I just wasn't getting it. And I was just like, what the fuck? I was like, maybe, am maybe I you did. Maybe you did have it. You just you didn't get any symptoms. Exactly. Yeah. I was isolating anyway, so it didn't matter. But I got the vaccine just to for for myself and for my mum and dad to put them at rest and sure. Um, my mom basically pushed me through the hospital door and pinned it in myself. She, she yeah. wanted us to have it no matter what. Yeah, she was you're, adamant. You're, you're actually the first person that I've spoke to that has has got the vaccine. Did you? Ha- I've did had you, both of them now. Did you? Yeah. And uh, yeah. did you have any negative uh, reactions at all? Um, on I didn't have any compared to what everyone like what some people had. The first one was completely fine. I was I was training the same day I had the first vaccine. Second one. I just felt a little bit groggy for like 24 hours. Um, just a little bit like, just a little bit off. Like, do you know when you're, when you're coming down with flu or you're coming down with a little bit of cold? That's what I felt like. And then I was just fine after that. I was irate. Arm, arm ached a little bit. But that's it. That's the same with any vaccine. I get the flu vaccine every year and I was exactly the same as that. There's no difference. Yeah, I, 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 I was sick. The only time I've been sick in about the last two years was last uh, year around March and I was just after being at a wedding and it was the last time I was sort of around people from different areas and that. And I was sick for about a week, so I probably did have it, but it was it was no worse than anything else I've ever had. Like, I just oh, felt yeah, a bit yeah. fatigued and I had, like, aches in my back and just yeah. I, did, I didn't feel my usual self, but I just I just stayed at home and sort of looked after myself and I went. So, Did you have problems with your breathing or not? No, nothing like that. No, no, no. Yeah. And like I've I've had um I've had a good few um tests since, four or five since, and they've all been negative. So maybe I, I built up the antibodies and of immunity to it. And um like I I've I've spoken to my doctor, like I've I have i have heard all the concerns about people getting the vaccine and I don't agree with um, in order for you to be able to do certain things that you have to get it that, that's yeah, that's wrong. infringing on people's human rights I think people should if you want to take it you take it if you don't you don't I don't well, think it's pe- forcing people into it isn't it that's, it's, it's not that's, that's not that's not on that's not fair so uh, uh, I spoke to my doctor he said no problem taking it I, I'll take it absolutely no problem man you could you could stick female hormones in me at this stage <laughs> for me to go back to work I just want to go back to work and and earn, <laughs> and earn my money honest to god that's that's all I want to do now so um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you got it and it's 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 brought you it's sort of made you feel a little bit more calm about the situation because obviously with, with everything that's going on it would have been sort of uh, you'd be worried about it, you know. So um, it, it, it's it's good to know that you you have that protection there now. I feel like a superhuman now. I've had it. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> invincible. You, you felt like you were immune beforehand. Imagine. Yeah, you were yeah, now, exactly. Man, yeah. I know, I know. Um, with with going back to work for DJs, I live I live across the road from uh, Christoph now. Yeah. So me and Christoph, our houses basically face each other, and. Um, so he booked in all this work to get done on his house before he went away. And then COVID, and he's getting all this work done on his house and COVID happened. And I'm looking at everything going, ooh, that looks expensive, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so he's dying to get back to work as well. How's, I think he's how, now. How's he dealing with um, everything? Has he been okay? Ah, he's been fine. Ah, he's all right. Nothing can affect uh, Cozzy like. Yeah. Which is which is what we call him. <laughs> yeah, he seems uh, He seems to have made a lot of music over the past year. The stuff that he, he, he making seems to be getting better and better. So at least he's uh, he's using his time well. I haven't felt yeah. as um, inspired or creative with everything that's gone over the past year, but it's good to hear that he's, he's doing well and that. And, uh, but... Um, uh, th- on this podcast, we, like it's 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 it is sort of a mental health podcast where I've checked in with with lads that I've played with and people that I respect and stuff, and we've talked about various things because 
there's a lot of bravado when it comes to men. We we don't talk about things that are affecting us. Uh, so like I we've talked I've talked on this about like OCD, uh, overthinking, anxiety, depression, um, all these types of things. Uh, I spoke to Mark Sherry. He was he was speaking for the first time about um, his best mate uh, dying from suicide and and the effect that had it had on him. So is 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 suicide something that has affected you in your own life? Um. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm very close to. I think it's about. God, so many people. I mean, my friend uh, tried to kill himself last year. And since then, we've all been like eyes on him, watching, like making sure everything's okay. I wanted him to move in with us, but um, he didn't want to at the time. So it's very, it's very, very, uh, very, very at home for me of of being around that. And it, as much as there's a stigma about uh, mental health in men, because of everything I've gone through in myself of like, realizing I had mental health problems, realizing that I was depressed and down um, after the whole TV scene. I, I've i got like a list and I stick to the list as best I can. I've wrote down a list. It was years ago and it, it's, uh, I mean, I've got the list there. It's exercise, uh, good A to Z vitamins. I've got a, a therapist. I try to check in with therapy. Um, friends is on there as well. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I just, I do that. I, I I stick to the list because I feel like, um, I think Jim Carrey said this, if you don't have good food in you, good nutrition and exercise and talk to counsellors, then you're not even giving your mental health a chance. And I feel like everyone should do that. And is, is therapy something that you're still doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I do therapy every week. Yep. Yeah. I love yeah. therapy. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yep. I've never actually really done, I've never done it myself. Um I've sort of always been, I've sort of seen it in the way that um, I'm my own problem and my own solution. So I like to learn and to teach myself. And like, it's probably a bit, I probably, there probably have been certain times during my life where I really did need to speak to someone. There probably is um, still now, but I sort of just, um, I educate myself. Um, if things aren't working in a certain way, I'll do them differently. And I, I'm lucky that I have an amazing wife here who can talk to anything about, and uh, we can we can get through anything together. And just sort of um, just stuff that's happened over the past year with myself, and I just realised that life is short, and you just like it's just have to make the most of your time here, and you just sort of uh, get on with it got on with it and obviously health and fitness eating the right foods as you said vitamins and, and stuff like that have but the gyms being closed and stuff are you still doing a lot of training and stuff yeah, you know? I, I, I just I just run um, that's all I do but it, with um, the exercise part of mental health what I say that because I, I basically at the minute I'm not exercising to get health uh, to get well uh, to get healthier yeah but I'm not exercising for my fitness as long as you get a sweat on as long as it's 10, 15, 20 minutes of workout, just run anything. As long as you sweat off it, it, it helps your mental health. It releases endorphins and um, serotonin in your head and stuff. And it was just, that's all I do now. That's all I do. I just do it just for my own mental health. Yeah, running is something that I, I've started to do and I got, get my 5K time down. I'm just, I'm at, uh, I think it was 20, 20 minutes, 20 seconds. So, Oh, that's fast. Not bad, yeah. I don't know whether, because uh, I have the, the Nike Air Zoom Pegasus. I think they're the they're the trainers that were, uh, they're being banned from pe people. They're not allowed to wear them when they're running. So I don't know whether it's <laughs> them or not, but yeah. The, my, my, t <laughs> my time got is... motors on them. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they're like trampolines when you're running on them and you're just bouncing down the road. But the running is, running is so good for your head. And just uh, as you say, I, I think it takes around like 21 minutes of of physical exercise for those endorphins to be released in your brain and um i've spoke about it before like uh the thing that really hit me at the beginning for the for this the really long lockdown that we've gone through was when they closed down the gyms because i was just like they can do whatever they want they can make me stay at home but if i can go to the gym every day that'd be fine so when they closed that down it really affected me but um you just have to adapt to that i think uh kyle you just have to find other ways of working out um, over the past month I've I've started I've, done, I've said right every single day I'm going to do 100 press ups no matter what 
So like at the end of the month, that's 3,000 extra press ups that I would never have done. And I can feel and I can see the benefits of doing it. And that's something that I'll continue doing as well. And uh, I got a book the other day. I don't know whether you've heard of a guy called Vim Hoff. Have you heard of the... I think I have, yeah. I, I do a lot of mindset training. I've got so many books written down that I've got to read. Yeah. It's like um, it's like cold water therapy. So that the last three oh years, oh shit yeah yeah do you know who he is man yeah. I follow him on Instagram he's yeah. fucking class yeah he's amazing so that's that's a that's a thing that I've, I haven't started on the the breeding section yet but um, the the cold showers is something that I've done in the last three days and it's cr- it's it's obviously you're they're gasping for air at the start but after about twenty five seconds it. The pain actually feels nice. It, like I don't know, man. And then at the end of it, if it honestly, it feels to me like my brain has reset. It's like a yeah. different part of my brain has been triggered, and it, it's amazing. And I think there's so many people who do like the sea swimming and cold water swimming, and and they swear by it as as a way of uh, of looking after their mental health and stuff. So it's it's something that I'm going to continue doing. On is is the cold showers or any of that stuff? Yeah. Is that stuff that you do. doing? I- I uh, so when we're in the challenge, we just did one in Iceland, and obviously the water's freezing. Didn't understand this whole cold water therapy thing. I got into the water. Uh, obviously, we had wetsuits on because I mean, God, it was minus five or something that day, and we swam. And I was like, "This is the coldest fucking thing I've ever felt." But I was in the water for a good ten to fifteen minutes. After I got out, I felt amazing. Mm. I don't know if I felt amazing because it was over, or I just felt amazing in general. But um, I love that guy. Absolutely love him. Uh, his whole, his story, his background, everything is, it's really, really inspiring. Yeah, he's crazy. He was like sleeping in igloos. He was building igloos at the age of 11 and sleeping in them. And he, he should have been dead when they found him in it. But he's still, it's just nuts. Um, I've only yeah. really sort of started to read it, but it's really interesting. And um, I'd, be, I'd be interested to reading about the breeding techniques and stuff. It's just uh, any way that I can... Um, improve my physical and mental health naturally without the use of like I've never ever taken like antidepressants or any medication nothing like that Um, I think that that obviously for some people it's essential and no judgment or anything like that I just for myself I think it creates more problems than it actually cures yeah you're, yeah, you're I think not, if it's chemical if it's, yeah. ke- if it's if your head's chemical and you need them then fair enough take them but if it's not and you just take them to get ahead of the curve I, I don't think the the, I think there's other better ways to tackle it, tackle yeah, mental health. True, food and exercise and talking and just changing your approach and doing different things and staying off your phone and not not reading shit. You know what I mean? You're just yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think social media is a big thing. Like I'm always on it and I shouldn't be. I like Facebook the best, obviously, because it's all my friends on there and no one's mean to us. But <laughs> I stay away from Twitter and. Uh, Instagram, I've got to do it for work, so I've got to keep up with that. I'm pretty much sure you're the same. You've got to, you've got. It's annoying because it's like a double edged sword. We have to be on social media for our work, but it also can be quite damaging. Yeah, I, I would love nothing. I've, I've said it a few times over the past. Year, I'd love to not to be able to do it, but I can't. It's just, um, yeah. Like I have, it's you have to, especially for myself. Like I can't just release music and sort of not show people who I am as well because it, I just look like a robot that way so to one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast is to sort of show the other side of me because I don't like to put a lot of stuff up on social media or to, to boast or to, to anything like that I'd rather put up real stuff and talk about real things and the feedback to this podcast has been amazing it's like people are really appreciate and I'm sure it'll be the same for this podcast to hear your experience and uh I find, uh, the only one I'd really use would be Instagram because uh, I just I find that people are a lot nicer on Instagram. It, uh, would it be the same for yourself or would you still get shit? Yeah. Oh, no, I still get a little bit of shit, but not much, I would say. Um, with Instagram, because people follow you, it, it, like especially with a DJ or myself, you look for that person to follow. You're not really going to spend your time looking for someone if you're going to drag them down constantly because they could just block you. Um, which I suggest everyone does. If you see a negative comment about you, just block them. Just done. Out your life, gone, bye. Um, whereas people seek you out and they seek me out and they follow us. So it's normally quite nice on Instagram or not too bad. 
Yeah, it's stra- it's, it's already mentioned it. It's, it's strange that the, the different ways people act on the different apps. It's it's so weird, man. So mm-hmm. weird. So it's the same weird. people as well. Yeah. It's the same fucking people. And it's, just, it's a completely different outlook on it. Yeah, they have different ways of acting on, on, on these vir- virtual apps that don't even exist. It's so strange, man. The world is really, really strange. I thought. I f- yeah, I know. I think with Twitter, people are after retweets. So if you post something negative you know it's going to get a lot of retweets because it's going to get a lot of reaction. It's like it's like what we were saying before, clickbait with um, media companies. They know that's going to get a lot of different shares and stuff, so they put a statement out there, and I think that's what the problem with Twitter is. Um, people are just fucking mean at the end of the day. Yeah. So so what, so what sort of stuff have you been getting up to so far in 2021? Um, 2021, well, I stopped, I stopped drinking. Um, not forever. Just I uh, wanted to do it until I go back in the show. And I've just been working on my house because I was meant to go away with the challenge in February and then it got pushed back. So, I mean, I was a bit wounded. I was a bit gutted, but I just looked towards the future and I knew that I was going to have to come and do that. I mean, I'm going away now in a few weeks. So I'm just training constantly. I'm just running and stuff. But I gave up drinking because I was sick of drinking in the house. I thought it was pointless. I've realised that I'm a social drinker, so when I drink, I like to be around people like yourself or or people at events or friends in a pub. If I'm drinking in the house, it doesn't do anything for us. Yeah, I'm exactly uh, I'm the same. I hate sit drinking there at home. Yeah, I hate it. Yeah, I think I've I've maybe drank twice this year and just a, a couple. It's just I prefer it if if I'm out somewhere maybe watching a match or going to a football match or watching exactly. in the pub. Perfect. Something like that is perfect. But, but sitting at home, just ah, not for me, man. Not for me. But I, yeah. I, I cut down a lot of my drinking over the past few years because it, just, it, just, it was just having a, a negative effect on, on my physical and mental health. So just I was there was a lot of gigs where I did Stone Cold Sober. And to be honest, there was a lot of them that I didn't really enjoy because so I needed that lubrication to sort of to sort of loosen me up when I'm on stage and to as bad as it sounds to enjoy it a little bit more but it's just because to I'm, get in the mindset yeah, to get like with every, like on the same level as everyone else just it's, man you're on a stage in front of a load of people you're going to feel self-conscious with people looking at you you know like so oh, I, you know you, you know yourself when people are looking at you and when you're, you're in people's view you start to become very fucking you're, you're man, self-conscious I was, of everything I was um, I was watching um you 2020 2000 yeah f- was it february 2020 yeah yeah february 2020 i think it was it was just before the lockdown the first one uh in amsterdam and yeah you were there was, weren't you because yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 so i was watching you and i was thinking to myself like even i'm i'm on tv i know there's like a lot of people watching so i was thinking fuck me this is quite nervous for him yeah <laughs> i was like this is quite this is quite a lot of fucking people I don't, it's, it's not really, a, I'm not nervous on stage and I'm going to make a, a mistake or anything. It's just, if, 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 if I don't have a few drinks to sort of loosen me up and to sort of just forget myself and to just get into it and enjoy it, that's, that's the only thing. But I had a few drinks that night, so I was grand. I was grand. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was the first time I had a bit of Johnny Walker in a, in a good five or six months. So I was, I was absolutely fine that night. And, and I'll yeah. tell you something, man, when the gigs come back, I'll be having a drink at every single one of them for a, <laughs> for a long time. Making I've, the uh, most of it. Yeah, the, the, the liver has gotten a nice little break for about a year. I've uh, I've got a lot of sleep over the last year after being probably sleep deprived for a good 10, 15 years. So uh, the batteries are well and truly recharged and I'm ready to go when this starts I'm, up again. I'm, man. I'm ready to go as well, mate. I'll be there front fucking row. Yeah. We'll t- <laughs> I, t- I think uh, Creamfields is uh, hopefully going to go ahead with Obviously, I think yeah. I think it will. Um, I'm trying to think the next one I'll go to. Uh, Creamfields I can't make because my baby's due like a week after. That's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Nightmare. If I pl- if I if we planned the pregnancy, I would have planned it different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would have made it like in January where nothing much happens. Yeah. But um, yeah, f- we're we're going to what's the next one we're going? End of September. That's the next trans event I'm going to. Which one is that? Um, a state of trance. Is it mid September, end of September, something like that? I think. Yeah, I think it's. It could be the second week, second week in September. Could second be very week. close to the ch- birth of your child, man. 
Well, I just had to crack it out early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I've had to miss one dance event. I'm not missing fucking two. <laughs> yeah, ho- hopefully I'll be hopefully I'll be there as well, man. Um, th- yeah, those gigs are fantastic because uh, I think it was the year before you were you were with all your friends and you dropped me a message to say that you were there, but <laughs> yeah. I, I was heading back. You were st- you were only getting warmed up. I was after being there a night already, and I was actually heading back to the UK to go to a, a game in Manchester. So that was a member you, you texted me, but uh, it was a me- it was a messy one. That it was a messy one. Oh, absolutely, oh, man. I'm, I'm yeah. too, too old it's for a stag that. Stag do. Oh Jesus! A load of yeah. a load of Jordy lads on a stag do. Can't <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Hell, man. But uh, <laughs> another uh, another thing we shared with last year was we we both uh, added a, a dog to our families. You got a yeah. German Shepherd named Oakley. Is that correct? Yeah, yep, yeah, that is that what, is correct. What, what was it like at the start when you got him? Um, well, he was a lockdown puppy, but we always planned on getting him. It was it was thought about well before this. I got him for Vicky um, for Christmas for my partner, and we couldn't pick him up till April. So it was a bit of a nightmare because obviously that was the heat of lock, like the big of lockdown. So when we got him, it was allowed, by the way, the, the law allowed us to go and pick him up, but that was it. Had to come straight back with him. And he grew up through lockdown. So now he's ex- he started to experience a life in summer without lockdown he's absolutely mental (laughs) absolutely mental you've seen marley off marley and me that's what he's like he just he's just crazy how's yours doing yeah he's really good man he's uh he's he's um at the very at the start now i'm not gonna lie it was difficult because it was like it was in november the weather was absolutely disgusting and um when we got him he, he unfortunately had a parasite in his stomach so we were waking up every morning and the kitchen was an absolute, it was covered in shite basically. Yeah. And it was, it was terrible, but, and like, there was a couple of days at the start where we were like, what have we done? I did, did we really think this true? Because we have our cat Jackson, who's six now and he causes absolutely no problems. He's, he was so easy to look after. Ah, uh, because the cat's the winner. <laughs> when you get, when you get a dog or a puppy and like the, we 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 had talked about it before about getting a dog and like the there was another one we had talked about getting and we thought it was a little bit too soon because the breeder said to us are you, are you really sure you want to get a thing because it's a huge um uh it's it's a huge responsibility to get it so we left it and we regretted it instantly so then we uh we contacted another breeder and he was just after having another litter so we we put our name down but around the time where um, we had to go and get it because it was around a, a 90 minute drive we had to go to to get the dog and the, the the country was in lockdown so we were really we were sort of unsure whether we could go to actually pick him up yeah and uh, the was, same as us there was a there was a, there was a whatsapp group um for for all the people who were picking up um the puppies from the breeder and there's this app called ways W A Z E that shows you where all the guard the guard are the police in in Ireland. So they show wow. you. Wow! It shows you exactly where the police checkpoints are. So every single day, I was checking on this app to see the best way to go to avoid the, the checkpoints. <laughs> so then, uh, so then the people were talking. I was, is anybody worried about um, being stopped? And then, the, then uh, I, I I popped into the conversation. I go, yeah, there's this app called uh, Ways. And I was giving advice to this certain person in the group. And the next minute my phone rings and it's the breeder. And he goes to me, Brian, see that fella you're giving advice about how to avoid the police checkpoints? He's a copper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I just, I, he was he was actually cool about it. He didn't he didn't say anything or, or rat me out or anything like that. As soon as you get there, you get a dog and you get arrested. <laughs> yeah. But he, he had to do the same thing. I, I, I think the... the, 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 the the, che- the checkpoints and all that were gone by the time we, we had gone to collect them and that fortunately but in advance of that I couldn't believe I was giving a guard a, or a policeman advice yeah. about how to avoid police checkpoints that was one of my most memorable memorable <laughs> things about having the dog but, that's class yeah and and, ha- and has your dog has he, he settled into the house and he's um yeah it's his house now I just live there yeah the same <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, yeah he's, he's been a bit of a nightmare so far but we're getting him trained at the minute and because uh, we're still allowed to go to training, but it's got to be outdoors. But he's in training a few twice a week now, so it's like a crash course. But it's hard for me because obviously I went away. I was away August, September, October. So I was away when the whole country was out of lockdown. So I never really got to experience life with a dog outside of lockdown. 
Uh, I've never had life outside of lockdown so far. Uh, when when lockdown ended, I went away filming again, and then I came back. I was got back on November fourth, and that was the same day uh, lockdown happened again, and we've been in lockdown ever since. Yeah, no man, Fucking brutal, tough, isn't it? Especially with the dog yeah. in the house and brutal weather and having to clean them every time you come into the house and the, the yeah. house is destroyed and hairs and boy, uh, to be honest yeah. with you, Kyle, I wouldn't change any of it. He's, he's brought so much to the house. I'm same, I'm the same, mate. Like, no matter what he does, he'll rip up a couch, he'll rip a blanket up, anything like that. Um, you just think, what would life be without him? And yeah. I'd rather have him in my life than not. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you, it's hard to imagine that, what, what how quiet your life was before you had him and... Just, just. I wish I was ten percent as happy as my dog, man. And that, that's <laughs> that's not to say that I'm depressed or I'm down or anything. It just, I'm just telling you about how happy he is and and about how he sees life and like he just, just loves his, he loves his life. He's always happy, no matter what you're doing. He'll just come in with a mouthful of whatever he's picked up off on, off the ground and he just wants to play with you. And it's just uh it's just they just have a great way of looking at life and I think uh, as humans we could learn a lot um, it's from, an adventure to him from dogs adventure and, yeah I think I think there was a I don't know what did you see that programme Afterlife with Ricky Gervais yeah did you see it. that yeah and I think there was a, a comment or a quote in it where it says like you should be the person that the dog how your dog sees you is how you should see yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. Just no be, judgment. Be, be the person that the your dog, dog sees, or, yeah, sees yeah. or something like that. I love that program. Yeah. Though. It's absolutely top notch. That's very good for mental health as yeah. well, the way he deals with everything. He's a he's a genius, man, Ricky Gervais. Fucking genius. The man. Office is my favourite show yeah. of all time. I watch it. I don't even know him. I know it off by heart at this stage. It's just absolutely genius. Absolutely genius, yeah, but... Just before we go, obviously you tipped on it a little bit more. It's uh, you've had huge news this year and a, a massive congratulations that you're expecting your first child. That must be very exciting. Um, yeah, well, we we didn't plan it. I'm not gonna lie, because uh, my my partner's always like, "Oh yeah, tell everyone we planned it." I'm like, "Fuck that! No, I'm <laughs> I'm fucking 28 years old. I didn't plan this. <laughs> my partner's only 25, um, so we didn't plan it. But uh, I'm so happy now." absolutely over the moon like can't wait uh we just got to find out if it's a girl or boy now i'm due september 6 i think it is so a couple of days after me mom's birthday um so it's big for her as well and it's just the whole family's like are you, big are, for them. are you gonna wait to find out or is this something you're gonna learn in advance um well i've been offered I feel like I'm selling my kids soul already but i've been offered a, fucking, a few magazine deals about doing a gender reveal and um, if I do do that and I take the money, I'm going to just put it in an account for, for them man. growing up. Absolutely. Just them. Do yeah. it. Do it. 100%. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Fuck that. Yeah. I'll, I'll do what they want for that money. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, um, yeah that's, that's, that's pretty much it, Kyle. Just uh, thanks very much to, for coming on the podcast today. You're an absolute gentleman. I really do appreciate it. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule. To, to come on today and uh, I wish you nothing but the best for the rest of the year thank you for having me on mate I really appreciate it and I can't wait to see you live again yeah, let's man. fucking do it yes we'll have a proper drink and a proper laugh the next time mate absolutely exactly perfect thank you very much Carl take care Paul no problem see you in see a bit you. bye bye bye